Shalom, shalom. Davon Mays here with Clouds of Torah. <clears throat> and we are continuing our series, Original Sin, Did We All Fall with Adam and Eve? I believe we are up to part nine. So uh, jumping right into this. Um, did you know, as somebody who teaches original sin, not me, but those who do teach it, you're basically saying you get one shot with Jesus. Since you're born a sinner, and then once you come to know Jesus or the New Testament or the Gospels, once you know what's going on and you make a mistake, that's it. You're finished. So <clears throat> if original sin is true, Christians, deacons, and bishops can never make mistakes. They would go back to not being able to rectify that sin. Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have we after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins so in 1 Timothy 3:10 it says and let those and let these also first be proved or tested then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless so let's say you were blameless you be, you repented, you became a Christian, and you make a mistake. You stole something. You told a lie. You, you did something you wasn't supposed to do. That was a sin. In 1 John, it says 1 9, in 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that's not what Hebrew says. It says, for if we sin willfully, after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So somebody got a problem here. Either John doesn't know what he's talking about. Or the book of Hebrews is just making up stuff. Now, I'm going to lean towards John because there's forgiveness and repentance all through the Tanakh. If you, especially if you confess your sins. Psalm 32. So whoever wrote Hebrews 10, 26, put a huge burden on Christians. You cannot make a mistake, especially if you teach original sin. If you're born with sin, so you already in a hole, you can never make a mistake if you was to ever come up out that hole, because then you're in the hole for good. So just thought you should know <clears throat> what Hebrews 10, 26 says. So speaking of testing or being proved, because it says right here that um, the deacons, it says, let them first be proved. Let these also first be proved. Most translations say tested or tempted. Actually, it's the same word. So we're placed in a body to be tested every moment. Job 7, 17 through 18. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set, set your heart upon on him? That you should visit him every morning and test him every moment. That's every moment. That's, that's all the time. Genesis 22 and 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Exodus 15, 25. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. So we see there's tests throughout the Tanakh. Nothing wrong with being tested. But if you was to make a mistake after the test, Tanakh says you can get forgiveness. You can repent. The um, whole nation of Nineveh, Jonah chapter 3 says the whole nation repented. And God did not destroy the city. He saw their works, that they turned from their ways and, you know, they fasted. They did some stuff and he, he didn't do it. But the book of Hebrews 10.26 says, no, you make the mistake, you're finished. So <clears throat> this tempting thing, this testing thing, why would God test you if you already have original sin? <laughs> if you're already a failure, then is he just seeing if you're going to keep failing? Like, what's the point of a test? A test is, you see, if you've gotten better, if you can pass it. Because if you can't pass a test, is it really, you know, worth giving? You know, it's just, it's a waste of time, right? 
if you know you can't pass the test, why take it, right? Why play a game you know you can't win? It's, it's kind of a waste of time. So in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his, his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Well, there's a lot of problems with this because we just read that God tempted Abraham. We read that God tempted Israel. And right after the Ten Commandments is given in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, it says, God is here to test you so you don't sin. So to say that, let no one say, I am tempted by God. Then to say God cannot be tempted by evil. That's another problem for Christianity. But. So did Abraham have a desire to sacrifice the son he waited for? Because it says each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. It says God called to Abraham and told him to sacrifice Isaac. I don't remember reading that Abraham wanted to sacrifice Isaac because he was waiting on him for like a long time. You're right. You know, does that make sense? Why would he want to? Was Did he have a desire to sacrifice Isaac according to this? I don't think so. And then, what desire for sin did Jesus have when he was tempted? Yeah, Jesus was tempted. So was he drawn away by his own desire and enticed? That's like lust, right? So if we re really think about this, in Matthew 5, 28, I believe it says, if you even think about it, it's a sin. You even think about committing adultery. Not that you seen somebody was like, oh, man, oh, no, I can't do that. Let me stop looking at her. That's a test. And then you cannot commit the sin. Right. That's that's how really how life works. You get tempted or tested and then you just don't commit the sin. But Jesus says once you even think it, it's a sin. So when Jesus was tempted, did he have to think it first? Was he drawn away enticed by his own desire? Let's see. What spirit led Jesus to be tempted? Matthew 4 and 1. Then when Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So if the devil's the one tempting him, but who led him into the wilderness? It says the spirit. Luke 4 and 1, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So if he has the Holy Spirit, it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So if the Spirit was Satan that led Jesus to be tempted, if Jesus is God, is that possible? Because we read that God cannot be tempted. So if that Spirit was the Spirit of Satan that tempted him, James says God cannot be tempted by evil. If the Holy Spirit led Jesus, that Holy Spirit is God or Jesus too, right? So, so God, and of course, if you're coming from a Trinitarian perspective, which is a ridiculous concept, but anyway, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is God or Jesus too, so God tempted himself because it said the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. So, is Jesus God tempting himself or did God tempt Jesus? Although James says this is not possible because let's say just God is God and Jesus is the son of God. He's just an Israelite, right? Regular person, not divine, just an Israelite because some Christians hold to this, right? Some don't even believe in the virgin birth. Believe that or not, but th this is true. I've seen debates about it. So let's just say God did tempt Jesus again. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. So who tempted Jesus if it wasn't God? And if it was Satan, it says God cannot be tempted by evil. 
nor does he himself tempt anyone. So who tempted Jesus? A, he tempted himself because he is God. B, God tempted him, which James says you cannot do. C, Satan tempted him, which James says you cannot do. So did he tempt himself? Did God tempt him or did Satan tempt him? Either way, we got a problem. They can't all be true, right? <laughs> and if the thought of sin, according to Jesus, Matthew 5, 28, condemns you of it, would that make him a sinner? Or if you already had original sin and you could not pass the test anyway, then what was the point? Or if Jesus was God and can't sin, what was the point? These are just questions. If God cannot make mistakes because he is perfect, why would he tempt somebody who else is perfect, who, who's also perfect? Or why would he tempt himself? And would he really allow Satan to tempt him? And what would be the point of that if he's not going to be tempted anyway? <laughs> is is y'all see what's going on here? So <clears throat> now <clears throat> the Christians love to say, well, Jesus was without sin. Well, according to what I just broke down, it doesn't look like it. So first Corinthians 10, six. Now these things became, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So again, lust brings on the enticement and the desire, right? You're thinking about something and, you start dwelling on it, and next thing you know, you're doing it, right? So James says, everybody is drawn out by their own desire. So what desire did Jesus have to that led him to be tempted in the wilderness? Then we go back to those same questions I asked earlier. First Timothy 6 and 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So again, harmful lust. <clears throat> what can I do when I get this money? You know, what can I buy? You know, can I? Can I'm going to show off all all the problems that come with being foolish with money, right? Harmful lusts. <clears throat> These are thoughts. They be everything begins as a thought, and then it turns into something, right? So when James says everyone is drawn out and enticed by his own desire. Because God, God's not responsible, even though we read in Job and in um, Genesis that God's the one testing people and in Exodus, right? So Hebrews 4.15, for we do not for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. How was he tempted if he was not drawn out and enticed by his own desire, which Matthew 5.28 says <clears throat> is a sin. If you even think it, it's a sin. It says, if you already thought about it, you committed adultery. Matthew 5, 28. So if he was tempted in all points, he had to be tempted because he was drawn out and enticed by his own desire. He was thinking about something. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, the Tanakh doesn't agree with this because if you get tested and pass the test, then I can't be punished for passing the test just because I had a thought. If something was placed in front of me, front of me if, I, if somebody, for instance, drops their wallet, right, and they walk away, or if you just find a wallet in the street, whatever, the first thought is how much money is in it? Am I, am I going to keep it? Look around. Wow, you know, you're tempted. You opened up, and let's say, you know, you know the person, and he owes you money. Do you take it and then give him his wallet back with the money, you know, less the money that he, he owes you? Do you give it all, give it fully back? What if you don't know the person, and it's a whole bunch of money? Do you give it back and expect a reward? Like, all these things go through your mind, right? Like, this is just normal human behavior. 
you, you had the, the thought of keeping the money is gonna cross your mind. Unless you're just a real holy roller, right? You just, you know, a saint. And most people at least gonna think about it. I mean, like, nah, I ain't gonna do that. But does it cross your mind? Probably. So to say, just because you think about something, you're condemned. That's it's almost like a way to say, well, see, that's why you need Jesus, because nobody can do that. Well, nobody gonna is nobody can do that. Everybody gets tested. That's the whole point of a test. If you were never even going to think it, what was the point of the test? Why was Jesus tested? To see what he would do. Because something was placed in front of him and he had to make a decision. Because if he was never, ever, even once going to not consider making a sin, what's the point of a test? That means he's not a person. He's not a human. He's not a man. Because that's what men do. It's just the, that's just the way we're built. We 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 think about stuff. We contemplate. So when it says in all points tempted yet without sin, it doesn't look like it again. So are non sinful people tempted? James one fourteen. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So in Luke one four, and Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why? If he was not drawn away by his own desires and enticed what was his desires and what enticed him and again what spirit led him into the wilderness did he lead himself did god do it or did satan do it and again if he led himself what's the point <laughs> like you're testing yourself like Think about that. If Satan did it, James says, God cannot be tempted by evil. And if Jesus is God, that doesn't work. Again, if Satan tempted him, then, I, I, by the way, I have a whole lecture on, are we tempted by God or Satan? If Satan tempted him, then it says in James, again, each one is drawn away by his own desire. So it really didn't, we really didn't need Satan to test Jesus if he's drawn away by his own desire. Or did God simply tempt him? And James says God doesn't tempt anybody. But again, we read in Genesis and Exodus and Job that God does tempt us or test us. So, <clears throat> again, are non-sinful people tempted? So if you're perfect, why would you need to be tested? Because you're not going to make a mistake. That's what perfection is. You can't mess up. God is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. If Jesus is God, he wouldn't have made a mistake. If Jesus was divine, he wouldn't make a mistake. In that, you know, how the Christians teach, you know, he's without sin, he's divine, he's the son of God. All these different things apply to him. So if that's the case, then he was really not like his brethren. So did Jesus overcome sin or never pass on to him? Which one is it? Because if he if it passed on to him, it makes a lot more sense. It's more relatable. It's more tangible, something we can, you know, digest a little better. Like, yeah, people make mistakes. So uh, because the New Testament tries to paint it as, you know, he was like us. So he knew what he was going through. Hebrews 4.15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Well, I just show in all points tempted without sin. That's that's not really true because according to him, even if you thought something, excuse me, that makes you a sinner. And according to James, you're drawn out and enticed by your own desires, you know, about by your own desire. So something had to trigger him to be led to be tempted in the wilderness because God didn't do it. Right. Um, like I said, I have a whole lecture on does God tempt us or does Satan tempt us? So if he's drawn on types by his own desire, that means it was his own, his own lust or whatever was going on in his mind that 
which according to him, if Matthew 5, 28, if you think about something that's wrong, then it's a sin, you know. Hebrews 2, 17, therefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto us, be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So to be made like his brethren would be mean, meaning he would be made like us. So if his brethren had original sin and he didn't have it, then he's not like his brethren. He's not going to have the same test and have the same, you know, outlook on things because he's always going to be making mistakes because he has original sin. He can't get right. So his brethren were sinners according to the original sin doctrine. So to say that he was made like his brethren, that's not true. If if he can't make mistakes, if he's divine or if he, if he is God, then he can't make mistakes, then you can't really be given the same kind of tests, can you? If you have no way to fail a test, then there's no point in giving it. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. So <clears throat> Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So Here's another reason that he was not without sin. So Jesus made his disciples sin by preventing them from fasting for three years. So check this out. Mark 2, 2, 18. And the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast. And they came and said unto him, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But thy disciples fast not. So this would include Yom Kippur and the other fast mentioned in the Tanakh. So we know Yom Kippur is once a year anyway, on top of the rabbinic fast days. And if you want to say, oh, that's rabbinic, that's oral tradition. Well, I have a whole lecture on why do Jews and uh, Christians reject the oral Torah. And there's a lot of oral, oral Torah actually recorded in the New Testament. When Jesus uses the term phylacteries, what is he talking about? You never heard the, the Pharisees or anybody accuse him of not wearing phylacteries. Because I'm sure if he didn't do that, they probably would have pointed that out the way the New Testament is structured. So with that being said, here's oral Torah in the Tanakh in the verse, Zechariah 8, 19. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and the cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Now, Deuteronomy 4.2 says, you should not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So, <clears throat> rabbinic ordinances, are they adding to the Torah? Adding a fast day is really, it's, 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 a, it's another commandment, but it's still just a fast. They didn't create something outside of the Tanakh. The Tanakh already had days to fast. So to add another fast day, um, according to Deuteronomy um, 17, it says, the, according, do what all the, the judges of those days tell you to do. If you have a question that's too hard, listen to the judges of those days. So the, the these fasts were decreed by the judges for certain reasons. They weren't just making up laws for no reason. And the oral tradition is very thick and it has to be read very thoroughly. And when you read the New Testament, there's there's things mentioned that you would not understand without the oral tradition. For instance, in the book of Acts, when it talks about they went on the Sabbath day's journey, what is that? When Paul said he was hit with lashes uh, 40 times less one, what is that? How do you sacrifice an animal? How do you circumcise a baby? The Torah tells you what to do, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. So, like I said, there's a whole lecture on why do Jews and Christians reject the oral tradition. So, in Zechariah 8, 19, the prophet recognizes the fast of the fourth month. What's that? The fast of the fifth month? What's that? What are these other fasts that the prophet's talking about here? This is in the written Tanakh. So don't tell me about you don't acknowledge the oral tradition when Zechariah did. 
when the New Testament talks about a lot of oral traditions, washing of the hands, making blessings on your food before you eat it. The Torah says you shall eat and be full and bless your God. So many things, and the, there's so many things in the New Testament that are oral tradition. Paul talks about many traditions that you received from him. <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is like I said, I did a whole lecture on it. But so if the disciples cannot fast while Jesus is with them, wouldn't he be causing them to make a sin? And Deuteronomy 4 2 says you can't take from the law, right? So did Jesus break the law? Luke 16, 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So again, Deuteronomy 4, 2. Don't add, don't take away. So Mark 2, 18 through 19. The disciples of John and Pharisees used to fast. And they came and said unto him, why do you the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But thy disciples fast not. And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So that would mean for three years, they didn't keep any of these fasts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the 10th, or the other rabbinical fast or whatever is going on in the New Testament, because it says other people, it says they was fasting like once a week or something. I forget the exact text, the way it's worded, but minimum, right? Just if we took Zechariah alone, one, two, three, four, that's four times a year Jesus is making them sin by not fasting. If we just go with that. If they can't fast, that means they can't do none of these fasts. And Yom Kippur is in the written Torah. So if they can't fast, they can't do Yom Kippur. And we know they were still keeping Yom Kippur in the New Testament. Acts chapter 27, verse 9. So to say that Jesus was without sin, no. So for three years... He was making them not fast. So you can't say he's without sin. So that means since the disciples knew Jesus. So, okay, okay, so let's back it up. They have original sin. They know Jesus. And then since they got the gospel, he gets them to sin again. And one says in, in it says in Hebrews 10 26, once you know the truth and you make a sin, there's no more sacrifices. So what just happened to the disciples? They're finished, according to Jesus. I don't think I was sharing my screen that whole time. So here's the, the, the verses I was quoting from. So Zechariah 8, 19, again, thus said the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast, therefore love the truth and peace. So again, we got Zechariah talking about all these fasts that the disciples couldn't keep for three years. So. Again, did Jesus break the law? Because he says, while the bridegroom is with them, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. He said, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. But then, break the law by telling his, his disciples they can't fast. And if you should not add to the word or take away from it, according to Deuteronomy 4, 2, then he should have never said, said nothing in Luke 16, 17. Especially if you're going to be having these people break the law and tell them they can't fast as long as I'm with you. That's a problem. So with that being said, I'm going to stop it there. This is part nine of original sin. Did we follow in Adam and Eve? We'll see you next time. And shalom.